In that case, we'll start. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for this special session on the theme of reducing deaths and injuries from residential fires through human perspectives. In a week which saw the fourth anniversary of the Grenfell fire, it's fitting that we'd make time to consider the human side of residential fires. My name is David Wells and it's my great pleasure to be your host today. I'm the founder of Shared Aim and we are proud to facilitate this session in partnership with the Avoidable Deaths Network. Shared Aim is a customer experience and service design consultancy. We work with a wide range of organisations in the public and private sector, helping them to understand their customers or users as humans first. This differs from typical approaches by embracing the reality that people are complex, variable and need to be understood within the context of their wider lives. Prior to establishing Shared Aim, I worked in the fire service when my interest in residential fires first began. For most of my career, my focus had been on learning various operational roles as a technical function in the belief that the better I did so, the better I served the public. That belief was shattered in 2009 when I led a pioneering research project to find out why the public did not behave as we expected or advise them to when they had a fire in the home. Incredibly, this was the first time in 20 years I'd heard our customers' stories in their own words and what they told me completely changed my understanding of what they needed from us. It also made me realize that one event can be experienced very different ways, depending on your relationship with it. As such, my perspective as a professional was very different to that as a public. I chose to be there, they did not. I could walk away at the end of the day, they could not. My life went on uninterrupted, theirs did not, even with small fires causing long lasting harm and life changing conditions. One of the conclusions of the research was that we as a fire service had failed to understand the experience of fires on a human level, and that we needed to change, not the public. Throughout the research, I was constantly struck by the extent to which the public described the experience in, their in terms of the emotions it evoked and how their personal circumstances were so important and had impacted on the fire and its result. Fire as an engineering and technical product is well understood, but human as a fire experience has been poorly understood and remains prone to assumptions and guesses. If we choose not to hear the story of those who experience fires directly, we'll be content with guesses rather than knowledge and we'll see it through the narrow lens of the professionals only. Before we begin our discussion, let me just take a few moments to run through the housekeeping points. During the presentation, everyone will be muted to allow the presenters to speak and, and make their presentations uninterrupted. But we would encourage you to invite, to put questions into the chat box. Please put those through at any time and we'll use the section at the end to ask the panel any questions you have. If we can't answer any, we'll try our best to follow up with it afterwards. And please note, this session will be recorded. If you prefer not to appear on camera, then please switch off your camera at this point, because we will make it, okay. excuse me. So excuse me, I'm out for the tip. Apologies for that. We will make the camera, uh, the recordings available afterwards, so please do switch off if you'd rather not. Right. Please bear with me. Okay. Apologies. Sir. Through the Grenfell inquiry, we continue to learn more about the events surrounding the tragic fire. The focus is often on the cladding and related issues, which is perhaps not surprising when you consider that fire safety is essentially seen as an engineering problem. Less frequently, but more poignantly, the inquiry has also revealed the human actions or inaction that led to this tragedy. Should we be not just as concerned, if not more so, about and frightened by the human factors that reside within the system and perpetuate the potential for further incidents? Fire throughout its journey, both in the origins and the aftermath, is essentially a human story. For those that work in the fire safety sector, it's easy to see the funders, legislators, regulations, codes of practice, inspection agencies, professional bodies, and other service providers as the customer. Many of these have visible and influential means for ensuring that their needs are met. And yet, of course, the real customer, the one most directly affected when a fire breaks out is the public, but they do not have the same ability to be heard as they lack a formal or organized means of representation. Encouragingly, there is an increasing number of individuals and organizations who are trying to raise awareness on their behalf. 
These include our distinguished guests today, Jill Koenig, Phil Murphy, and Christian Morgan. And I'm delighted to welcome them all today. Each will offer their own perspective on the human side of residential fires, based on a combination of their research, professional experience, and expertise. This will then be followed by a discussion exploring why a greater focus on human need and experience is likely to help us both better understand the problem and come up with new solutions to improve and advance fire safety. If fire safety solutions are going to extend beyond sticking a plaster on a broken system, we need to be clear about the problem we're trying to solve and involve all those affected by it. Before I pass over to our first guest, I'd like to introduce Nibidi to Ray Bennett, who is a founding part president of Avoidable Deaths Network and associate professor in risk management at the University of Leicester. Nibidita will conduct a poll and provide an overview of the Avoidable Deaths Network. Thank you, Nibidita. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. So can I have my slides up, please? Of course. Unmute. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good morning from the UK. My name is Nipadita Ray Bennett, and I'm one of the founding presidents of the Avoidable Deaths Network. The other founding president is Dr. Hideyuki Shiroshita, based in Kansai University in Japan, and he will be joining us shortly. I am an associate professor in risk management based at the University of Leicester School of Business. So thank you very much for joining today's session reducing deaths and injuries from resi residential fire through human perspectives. A big thank you to our esteemed speakers, Jill, Mr. Phil Murphy, and Dr. Christian Morgner for accepting our invitation. I would also like to thank the ADN team for putting this session together, especially Denise Corsell, Joyce Corsell, who is with us now, Hideyuki Shiroshita, and Shohidul Hawk. We would like to thank Shad Aim, especially David Wells, for hosting today's special session. Now, having concluded the thank yous, my job today is to introduce Avoidable Debts Network briefly. We can go to the next slide, David. Thank you. Just click, yeah, thank you. So what is Avoidable Debts Network or ADN? ADN is a diverse, dynamic, inclusive and innovative global membership network of experts, practitioners and researchers interested in avoiding human debts from natural hazards and naturally triggered technological hazards and human made hazards. ADN was launched on 12th March 2019 at the fourth summit of the Global Alliance for Disaster Risk Institutes in Kyoto in Japan. Uh, next slide, please. ADN is often misunderstood as an NGO. ADN is not an NGO. ADN is led by the universities of Leicester and Kansai with regional coordinators. The University of Leicester offers a flexible learning MSc in risk, crisis and disaster management. And I am the program leader. And our, our today's chair, David Wells, is our alumni. Kansai University offers BA and BSc in safety science. And I would request you all, if you're interested in any of these programs, please feel free to visit our websites. Next slide, David. Thank you. So why we exist? ADN exists to help and inform policymakers, practitioners, and researchers to make better decisions to save lives and reduce injuries to achieve sustainable development. By 2030, we want to be recognized as global leaders on avoidable debts for impactful research, solution, services, and engagement. Next slide, David. Thank you. So what are we doing to achieve our purpose and vision? Currently, we are undertaking six interrelated activities. First, collaboration for research and, and solutions. Second, we are hosting conferences, seminars, and special sessions like today's. 
We promote state and non-state collaborations wherever possible through research and engagement. We adv advocate mainstreaming the agenda of avoidable deaths in the heart of disaster and development policies and programs. We publish biannual ADN newsletter and bulletins, and we solicit public and private funds for ADN's growth and agendas. We can move on to the next one. Thank you. So we launched the special session, the first special session on avoidable deaths on the 4th of December 2020 at the International Conference on Geographical Science for Resilient Communities, Ecosystems and Livelihoods, Livelihoods under Global Environmental Change. And this launching event was organized by Makarari University in Uganda. The special sessions are knowledge exchange and engagement webinars delivered virtually to the public for free with the aim to raise awareness on the concept of avoidable debt and their avoidance through theoretical and practical solutions or both. The special sessions also raise knowledge and awareness on those debts that are often not in the mainstream agenda of policymakers, practitioners, and even academia. The special sessions also bring human stories or perspectives at the center of policy and practice debates. Like today, leading experts and practitioners are invited to speak at the special sessions. So far, the ADN team has organized five uh, special sessions, including today's event, in collaboration with host institutions in five countries. We have had 20 speakers and more than 222 attendees for the special sessions. We can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So the ADN truly is global. We have three hubs, one in India, and the other two are networking hubs in Uganda and Bangladesh. We have 20 regional coordinators across the five continents. We have 35 organizational partners, and we have 14 well-renowned multidisciplinary advisors from 10 countries. The next one. So how can you join ADN? You can join ADN as an affiliate or organizational partner or regional coordinator or as an advisor. So please visit our website and the link is on the slide for more details. So we can move on to the next one. So these are some of our publications. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. A few more publications related to avoidable deaths. And I think this is it. Um, I, I hope uh, you will, um, if you haven't joined ADN, you will join ADN today. And um, as David has mentioned in the beginning that we are currently capturing the impact of our special sessions. So for this, we will run two polls. We will launch the first poll now, and the second poll will take place after the panel discussion. And that poll will be launched by my colleague, Dr. Hideyuki Shiroshita. So Joyce, May I request you to run the first poll, please? So please use your screen or if you have a pad, something you can just... The poll should be running now. Now, yes. So Joyce, is it a minute? Um, just coming up to a minute, and we've coming up to a minute. Yeah, about sixty percent of participants answered already. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I think we usually like eighty percent response rate in order to be consistent with our previous yeah. polls. Yeah, so we will give um, another few seconds or so. So we still have yeah, a few more seconds. So please, may I request you all who have not taken part, please do take part. This will be very helpful for us. Uh, Nibidita, sorry to bother, but I don't seem to be able to edit the the poll, so I can't just you know click on on any of them. Uh, I think you are. Wrong. 
I think because you are one of the speakers, maybe you're not allowed. You're part of the organizer. Okay. Christian, Thanks. hello. That's, that's all right. Sorry <laughs> Thank about you. that. <laughs> Thank you, Christian, for joining. Yeah, I hope others are able to do it. So we have reached 75%. So I think a little bit more, a little bit more. Please feel free. Guys, we have not done it. Please do it. So we have a population of... So we have 33 attendees, 26, 78, two more percent. Yeah, another few seconds and we will finish it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so we have gone beyond two, two minutes. So I think we will have to stop it here. So we have about 44% who thinks they have a little knowledge and about 33%. So the majority has some knowledge of these human perspectives to reduce deaths and injuries. And we will see how this, this result changes for the second poll. So thank you very much. We have got a brilliant response rate, 87%. We are happy with that. And I think Joyce, please take a screenshot and uh, save it. And I think with this note, I'm going to stop talking because I am really excited to listen to our brilliant and really high profile speakers. And I can only thank them for accepting our invitations. And also I would like to thank David once again for organizing this event with us. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, enjoy listening to the speakers. Thank you. So David, over to you to welcome our- Thank speakers. you, Nivedita. Thank and you. I'm now very pleased to be able to introduce our first guest, Jill Koenig. Jill is a master consultant with JMG, sorry, JMJ Associates, partnering organizations in high hazard industries to develop the leadership and culture needed to prevent accidents. Her book, Catastrophe and Systemic Change, there we go, which I highly recommend, brings together her personal and professional lives. Jill lived on the 21st floor of Grenfell from 2011 to 2014 and seven of her former neighbours died in the fire. Campaigning for change, in 2020, she was voted as one of the top 25 most influential people in health and safety in the UK. She hosts the blog, The Grenfell Inquirer, speaks and writes to promote authentic debate and inquiry. Jill's presentation is titled Systemic Change on Myths and Disruption. I'd also add, like to, that's Jill's per official bio, but I'd also say, having known her for a number of years, she's also the source of inspiration for many people and has been tireless in trying to create different debates around Grenfell. Jill, over to you. Thanks, David. And um, I was just thinking about how wonderful it is to listen to the global reach of this network. So um, before I, I dive in, is just to thank everybody um, that's listening for everything that you're doing to alleviate the human suffering that's a consequence of these tragedies. Um, and, you know, David, it's great. Thanks for inviting me. You've, I appreciate your words and you've been a source of inspiration to me too. I'm very grateful that we met um, a number of years ago. So I, I'm going to talk through some of the concepts that I use in the book. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to talk to what is the intent of writing it? What do I mean by systemic change? Give a very high level overview of, of the results of my analysis and then dig into two specific things. What are the myths that stop systemic change and how might we disrupt things um, to enable systemic change? Um, and I am going to start sharing a little bit of my story and there are for anybody that might be triggered pictures of fire. So just in this next slide, so if anybody finds that triggering, just don't look at the following couple of slides and David, if you can move on. So um, my book is really, as David said, a result of both personal and professional um, lives. Uh, the picture on the left is obviously Grenfell. So I lived in Grenfell from 2011 to 2017 um, on a beautiful, beautiful apartment on the 21st floor. Never lived in high rises before then. 
fell in love with living high rises for two things. Number one is the views and number two is the community. So I bought an apartment nearby in a high rise and my view is of Grenfell. And the picture on the left is what I saw. Um, I, I saw it first at around 1.30 in the morning um, on the 14th of June, four years ago. Uh, and then because professionally I work in high hazard industries to prevent catastrophic events and I've obviously inside of that studied a number of them. While I was watching the fire, the picture I had in my head was on the right. So of Piper Alpha, which is, I'm sure many of you know, still the worst industrial disaster in the UK. Um, North Sea explosion, 167 people died. And I didn't know at the time, um, but there are a lot of similarities between Grenfell and Piper is number one, there was a refurbishment of Piper that made um, the master point more dangerous. So people died in the master point. And secondly, the people that survived were people that violated guidance and jumped into the North Sea. So the guidance at the time was that would lead to certain death. But in fact, the only people that survived were the people that jumped into the sea. Um, and then if you if you move on to the next slide, there was, you know, this is still a fire for anybody that doesn't want to watch. This is the last one of a fire. It was about um, probably two or three in the afternoon of the 14th of June. So the fire had been going for more than 12 hours and I was sitting on my balcony and um, the, the picture that's there for me is the bursts of orange flame. So, do you know, I just couldn't believe how vivid the flames are. I'm not the fire engineer. It was just shocking for me that so far later, and it's probably because the gas mains hadn't yet been turned off, but I was sitting there and watching it and that's kind of imprinted on my brain. And I was with a journalist, um, Matthew Price, who was from the BBC at the time, he's now with Sky, and turned to him and said to him, I promise I'll do whatever it takes to make sure we learn. Um, and that for me changed my life. Um, it certainly didn't go in the direction that I thought it would. So I kind of anticipated, okay, well, we'll just, you know, I know about learning from events. We'll just get the right stakeholders together and we'll start learning. Um, and then discovered the multiple failed opportunities to learn prior to Grenfell, the multiple fires that had happened, the global um, knowledge of, you know, cladding, the dangers of cladding and, and fire spread. And then also in the UK, and I don't know if everybody will realize this, but the scale of the building safety crisis. So there's literally, you know, like one in four high rise buildings has dangerous cladding on. And there's multiple other failures such as, you know, cavity, cavity barriers missing or poorly installed, fire doors that don't um, protect for the required 30 minutes, um, single escape routes. I mean, there's just multiple, multiple failures across the whole of the UK in terms of building safety. And then on top of that, the findings that we're getting out of the inquiry, which is terrible practice by product manufacturers knowingly marketing um, flammable products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, these things, the scale of the failures to learn, the extent of the safety crisis, um, building safety crisis within UK, and then the findings from the Grenfell Tower inquiry is really what led to the book because I went, we have to start having some different conversations. And if you move on to the next slide, and that's about the last, the last picture of fire for anybody. So this is a statement I made, I was interviewed um, by Matthew, the journalist that I, I shared about two days after the fire. I said, we have to get beyond blame to the systemic and cultural and leadership issues that actually led to decisions being made. We can't end up going, it's because of the cladding. Yes, we have to hold people to account for their broader systemic issues that need to be addressed. And that was probably the, the beginning of me really inquiring into what, what do we actually mean by systemic change? Because I said the term systemic change, everybody else was going, okay, systemic change, we need systemic change, but there didn't seem to be a shared understanding of what that meant. 
my intent in the book and my intent in speaking at events like this is not to um, uh, not to kind of speak the truth or say this is what we should do, but rather to open debate and inquiry. So I'm offering my perspective of, on something with the intent that it opens inquiries rather than trying to prove that my point of view is accurate, because I think what's fundamentally missing is the right types of conversation. So if we go to the next slide, um, th this summarizes um, how I've ended up defining systemic change. And some of you are probably aware of the work of Peter Senge, who's a, a very well-known systems thinker. And there was an article that I read um, called The Waters of Systems Change, which made me start thinking um, in this way. I mean, it's a different model, but that really was the inspiration to me is there's essentially two distinct things that we need. We need piecemeal change and we need systemic change. And piecemeal change is, as you can see on the slide, we, we're solving one part of the system. It assumes a controllable, predictable world. We fix what's wrong. We look at technical solutions. The leadership style is bureaucratic, con command control, expert driven, et cetera, et cetera. And in response to certainly Grenfell, but in my experience watching, for example, the pandemic as well, most of our responses tend to be a, a, certainly from the mindset of piecemeal change, which I think stops us from learning. And if we want to get better, we need to also look at systemic change, um, which is far more complex, um, far less uh, tangible, uh, far less neat, uh, you know, it's, it's the assumption is that we live in a complex emergent world and the intent is to shift the conditions holding the status quo in place, which we'll, we'll get to a little bit later in the conversation. And the question you need to ask is not what's wrong with the system, but you need to ask what is the system perfectly designed for? You essentially need to step back and get a picture of what the system is currently doing, which is what I try and do in the book, which is make the water visible. And your approach to change is one of disruption. So what you're trying to do is disrupt the status quo. And you don't actually know what's gonna work or what's not gonna work. So there's a, a, a level of experimentation and disruption required. And critically, I think the leadership style is completely different. So our traditional bureaucratic bureaucratic command control style of leadership doesn't work. You want to be values and principles based. You want to um, allow organic and emergent change to happen. And all stakeholders expertise and knowledge is critical. So back to David's point is people that are impacted by the fire, the public, all stakeholders, um, really their expertise is important in solving the problem. So if we go to the next slide, um, this really captures what the book is about, which is an attempt to make the water visible and answer the question, why does our failure to learn make sense? And the relevance of the, the fish is there's this, um, it's, it's called the fish parable, is there's two fish swimming uh, along and the older fish says to the younger fish, how's the water? And the younger fish says, what's water? So it's, it's an attempt to uh, help us to step back and make the water visible and, and look from a systemic change perspective, what is at play that's stopping our ability to learn from these disasters. If we can go to the next slide. So what I end up in, in, in the book is creating a model for systemic change that looks at governing and operating frameworks and then obvious and ob obscure elements. And your foundational uh, structural elements include things like regulations, guidance, governance, accountability. So what are the things we put in place that should prevent catastrophic outcomes? And then behavioral elements, which is what are the mechanisms in place to prevent and respond. So for example, regulators, scrutiny mechanisms, inquests, inquiries, those kinds of things. And most of our response and attention focuses on these obvious elements. But actually when we move to the obscure, so relational issues, you know, the interactions between stakeholders, so things like regulatory capture, 
speaking truth to power, the revolving door between government and industry, those kinds of things are as critical as um, you know, the more obvious elements, as is contextual elements. So our mindsets, trust, our biases, our assumptions and our beliefs. And if we don't look at all four of these, we won't en enable systemic change and we certainly won't have the right conversations. So if we can move to the next slide or the next, I can't remember if it's a build or not. So in the analysis in the book, I look at all of those, each of those elements and under each of them look at myths, what are some of the known issues, dig into something from Grenfell. So it could be, you know, I don't know how much you know about it, but approved document B, so the regulations or speaking truth, speaking truth to power. So there's, uh, you know, lessons from Grenfell. And then look at what are the conditions holding the status quo in place that stop us from learning and what might be the opportunities to disrupt. And for today's session, I'm gonna dig into two of those. Number one is what are the myths? And number two, what are the opportunities to disrupt? And the pictures there are of disasters. So again, in each of them, I dig into a disaster. So in structural, the Great Fire of London, behavioral, the Boeing 737 MAX disasters, and then the Costa Concordia in relational and the Hillsborough disaster in contextual. So just, just that, you know, and it's the, the methodology is inquiry based. So it's inquiry and, and observation. If we go to the next slide. Uh, this is a summary of what I found. So making the water visible, what's the, the messy kaleidoscope? These are what I list as the factors that contributed to Grenfell. But when I started writing the book was right at the beginning of the pandemic. The original title was Grenfell and Systemic Change. But I saw all of the same issues playing out with um, the pandemic. So expanded its scope to catastrophe and systemic change. So if you look at these, you see the same issues coming up over and over again. And we keep failing to deal with them. So we keep failing, at least in the UK, to deal with regulatory vulnerabilities, high turnovers, complex delivery mechanisms. We know those issues and we don't deal with them. We know those issues with supply chain management, with um, failure to respond to scrutiny, with inquiry recommendations. We know all of these issues, you know, regulatory capture, speaking truth to power, bias. We know them and we don't deal with them. So if we, if we look at them making the water visible, that really is the picture of why our failure to learn makes sense. And if we go to the next slide. And just click again. So this is now what I think, yeah, just do four clicks and then I'll talk to them, thanks. So this is what I say are the myths that are holding the status quo in place. So firstly, I think we have a myth, we hold on to a myth that regulations guarantee safe outcomes and they simply don't. I'm not saying regulations aren't important, but regulations by their nature are reactive and on their own will never prevent a catastrophe. Yet over and over and over again, I have people tell me we've changed the regulations, everything's gonna be fine. So I think there's a, we need to bust the myth that regulations guarantee safe outcomes. You know, safety is an outcome of a complex socio-technical system and regulations are one input into that. And we have to give up the, the, the myth that they will guarantee safe outcomes on their own. And then from a behavioral perspective, um, there's the, the myth of the perfect error-free world. And when something goes wrong, it's simply because there was one bad apple that did something stupid. And if we remove that bad apple, we'll be returned to this perfect state where everybody will um, behave in the way that we want them or in a way that's predictable. So we again need to challenge um, that myth that, you know, everybody makes errors, everybody makes mistakes. The issue is not about being error free. It's about having systems that are resilient to error. Um, so that's the second myth. And then the third one is that softer relational issues aren't that important. So in Grenfell starkly, you know, we had residents saying and predicting that there would be a catastrophic fire and they weren't heard. So you have to get into the nuances of which voices count. 
and which knowing is um, which ways of knowing are, are valid um, when, when you're looking at preventing disasters. So, but I think these are just dismissed as they're not that important. And then finally, that you can create systemic change without shifting context. Um, and we see that, for example, with the Hillsborough disaster. So, do you know what are the, the fundamental biases against, I mean, in this case, actually against the police? And we've just got another inquiry coming out, um, findings coming out, I think yesterday, pointing again to the biases and the context and the place that the police think from is contributing to deaths. So, uh, uh, until we're willing to tackle, challenge, engage with complex contextual issues, we won't see systemic change. So that's what I would consider are the myths that hold um, the status quo in place. And then David, if you go to the next one, and again, if you, if you just click four, because it's, it's a similar. So this is what I say are, I think, um, opportunities to disrupt the status quo. Uh, the first thing is, increasing our capability to deal with complexity and ambiguity. So back to one of the first slides that I showed about piecemeal and systemic change is really stepping into the space of complexity, of emergence, of how do you lead in complex worlds that you can't control? How do you enable change in that, being far more comfortable in that space? And a lot of that requires ambiguity. Um, dealing with and being comfortable with ambiguity. The world is simply not one where you can go, these are the rules, follow them, and everything will turn out correctly. So I think there's a, a need for everybody to, to acknowledge and then learn how to engage in a world of complexity and to hold ambiguity and uncertainty. Secondly, uh, ensuring fairly born consequences. So again, some of you will know and some of you won't, but right now in the UK, the government has given 5.1 billion to removing cladding from high rise buildings. But estimates are that it will cost between 15 and 50 billion to correct fire safety issues across the housing stock. And who's being burdened with that to a large extent is leaseholders who own properties in, in, in these dangerous buildings. And one of the things from a culture change perspective is consequences shift culture. So if you're a developer, a managing agent, a, the government, construction firms, architects, the people that created the mess are not bearing the consequence of it, you won't get the benefits of culture change because there's, you know, what's the imperative to change? So ensuring fairly born consequences from my perspective is a key opportunity to disrupt. And mostly at the minute, how that's being, um, chat or where that's being championed for is, is through those that are impacted, not by the government. So government and industry is not going Okay, this was us, Mia Kalpa, we're going to pay. It's being left to the thousands um, of people that are impacted campaigning every day, having their lives taken over by it. And then from a relational perspective is the tapping diverse and distributed knowledge. So the notion of, uh, you, you know, diversity and cognitive diversity and making sure not just that we are including those um, voices, but that they have power so that they're in decision-making positions versus I sometimes feel like there's this patronizing, okay, well, we'll do like a resident survey and then somehow we've included their voices. A voice without power means nothing. So I, th I think there's tapping diverse and distributed knowledge and being very aware of, of the power dynamics of that. And then finally, creating safe spaces to, ch to challenge deeply held views because you can't um, shift something unless there's a psychologically safe space to say what you really think. And some of those views might be distasteful to others, but that doesn't matter until, until we're willing to create spaces where people can truly authentically share what it is that they think, what it is that they believe. 
and then be in a in a conversation where collectively those views can be challenged and new meanings and sense making can emerge collectively. Um, I, I think that's a, a an enormously powerful opportunity to disrupt and and things like citizens assemblies and citizens forums are, are good methodologies by which we can do that kind of thing. And I think there's just one more slide. Bit, which, so I do I, I do want to end with what I call of hope. So as I went through the process of watching the fire and um, you, you know seeing the lack of change and then writing the book, I was determined that I was going to find hope somewhere. And at times it didn't feel like that was possible. And um, David and Phil have been through many of those moments with me. Um, but I have found hope and it is in what I would call the democratization of change. So uh, the connected world gives us the opportunity to to, to work together to enable change. I mean, just if you, if you look at the global nature of this group on a digital platform, if you look at the people involved in the cladding scandal who are now much more strategic and will not back down. Um, and I, I think there's enormous hope. I don't think it's fair that the people that are victims of these things should be the ones that are creating change, but that is where hope lies. I can't remember if I included a quote at the end or not, David. I don't know if there's another slide or not. So there's uh, some of you may may know the work of Rebecca Solnit, who's an American author who um, ha has studied a, a number of disasters. And I found incredible comfort in her words. I, I'm not going to read it out because I always cry when I read it. But I'll just keep quiet for a minute because these words just really resonate for me in terms of where hope lives and also the beauty of post-disaster communities and the connections that they make. So I'm, I'm gonna just keep quiet and let people read that. So I, I will end by saying thank you everybody on this call for the tiny steps that you take. And that's it, David, so back to you. Oh, I forgot to say that. That's the, the details of the book and the podcast. I just forgot to say that. If you go back one, David, that's probably worth letting people know. Sorry, always forget about the details. It's fine if you can't, I'll ping them in the chat. Okay, there. so there's details about the book. Um, you can get it on Amazon or direct from my publisher, London Publishing. And then we've also done a phenomenal, I love the podcast series that goes with it and details are at the bottom there, which we've got some amazing guests um, just digging into each of the, the areas. So I, I invite you if you're interested by the book and, and also just listen to the podcast, I think. Hopefully, my intent is they create different conversation. So thanks, David. Thank you, Jill. So many things I'd love to ask you about. That it's, um, I'd encourage all of our attendees, please, if you have any questions, and I'd be amazed if you don't have any comments or questions after the, the ground that Jill's covered, please put them in the chat box and we'll try and pick up on them. I think the thing that always comes back to me is who owns fire safety? who gets to say what it is and how it's done. And uh, I think I always sit behind a lot of this, but thank you so much, Jill. David, yes. just a quick one, because I won't be able to say goodbye to Jill. Jill, would you mind if we post the link of your pod podcast on Edian's website, face all the social media platforms? Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thank <laughs> you, Jill. Thank of you, course, everybody. thank you. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to introduce and welcome our second guest, Phil Murphy. I've met Phil relatively recently, but we have a shared background in the fire service, so plenty to talk about. Um, Phil encapsulates an unusual combination of work 
and life experience that give them a fairly unique, holistic and highly specialised perspective on residential high-rise building safety. He has lived in three different high-rise blocks, is a former Greater Manchester Fire Service firefighter and fire officer, a high-rise residential building fire safety management advisor, and a high-rise fire safety researcher, and he tirelessly campaigns for housing safety. Phil's presentation is titled High-Rise Residential Building Evacuation Fact Check, and I'm delighted to welcome him and know that Phil's been doing some incredible research that will uh, bring to light, again, another perspective on residential fires. Phil, over to you. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Jill. Uh, thanks, everybody else. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, I'm halfway through Jill's book now, and it's an incredible piece of work. I think it should be required um, continuing professional development for anybody that works in the residential fire safety sector. It's uh, the, the reference in, in it is fantastic. So I, I recommend it very highly. And the, and the podcast as well. I, I listened to the first one recently and that was really, really good. Um, my first job in um, as, a, as a firefighter, my first station was Mossside Fire Station. That's where I learned my trade, my craft. Um, at the turn of the century, and at that time, that fire station was amongst the busiest fire stations in Europe. It was completely surrounded um, by blocks of flats. So I've got I've got that firefighting perspective. Um, but the one that that I've got perhaps that more than others is is the fact that I've lived in diff three different high rise blocks, and I think that that gets missed a lot. Jill Jill spoke about that, um, the importance of that perspective, that I think is is often overlooked. Um, and more than the others. Um, next slide, please, David. Um, I've, I've drawn information from all over the place over the last few years. Of the, uh, this is an example. This is um, uh, features a report by the Confederation of Fire Protection Associations across Europe. Um, there's, there's, we've missed the international perspective on on on, on this lately on high-rise fire safety. Um, and it's something that we really need to take more notice of. And I think it would be remiss of me not, not to mention um, the, um, the situation of disabled people in, in high rise buildings where uh, there's a, a consultation at the moment um, about whether, whether uh, disabled people that can't self evacuate from high rise flats should have an escape plan. Um, the, personally for me, it's, it, it's a no brainer um, I, I don't know if anybody heard the story of Mr. Elpidio Bonifacio, who lived on the 11th floor of Grenfell Tower, and um, he was stuck in, in that flat whilst it was on fire for more than seven hours because he didn't have an escape plan. Uh, and last night I spoke to a chap called Maher Kuder, who lived on the ninth floor and had polio and couldn't, couldn't move without crutches. Um, and he sent his wife and children ahead of him. And it took him about 40 minutes to get down the stairs, but he got out, he got out alive. Um, and, and that's the essence of good fire safety, really. Um, next slide, please, David. Okay, we're gonna be talking a lot about timing. Um, it's a critical factor um, when we talk about e evacuation. We've got available safe evacuation time and the required safe evacuation time and the gap between what you need and the time that you've got is your safety margin. That's your redundancy. If that gap starts to shrink, then you've got a less resilient system that's less reliable. Because if anything goes wrong during the required evacuation time, you're going to quickly eat away at your safety margin. And if the required time exceeds the available time, then we've got big, big problems. Uh, the uh, required time is made up of various factors. Um, not listed on that slide is, is the time of ignition. That's the time before it's detected or seen. Uh, the, the time it, it requires to raise the alarm, uh, recognition, response, and ultimately evacuation. Next slide, please, David. So time as a factor has been something that, that we, have, we have given some focus for some years. This was a, a British government 2012 investigation into our, our, our fire incident data. 
Um, we radically changed and extended our recording of fire incident data in 2009. So by this point in 2012, we were starting to develop um, a, a much more accurate idea of, um, of what was happening at fires around England. Um, and, and we've always put a, 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 a due attention on, on the response time. And that's the, the time it takes for uh, the emergency services to arrive and put the handbrake on at an incident, as it were. And we can see there that, that there's quite um, a difference between not just between uh, zero to five and, and, and uh, 16, 20 minutes, but once we get over that 20 minute point, there's a, um, a marked downturn in, in the, the, the prospects for somebody that, that's um, stuck in a, in a fire incident and um, the, the likelihood of fatalities and, and, and casualties um, rises significantly um, as, as, as you go through that first 20 minute point. But when we get to the 20, 20 minute point, it jumps. And we're, we're, we're gonna see that 20 minute period come up again and again. So, so um, remember that, that one, that 20 minute period. Next slide, please. Now, this is a diagram from the same, um, from the same document. I, I've added in that line there at 20 minutes because it just happens to be the point at which a person in a fire incident is more likely to die than they are to come out of that incident alive. Um, rescues start off quite well. Um, and the, the, the rate of um, casualties or fatalities is the vertical axis on the left. And you can see that the, uh, the likelihood of rescue goes down and down and down, and the likelihood of somebody dying rises until they cross over. And after 20 minutes, um, you're more likely to come out of an incident dead than you are alive. Um, next slide, please, David. Now, this, this is a, an, another look at that same time period. I've added that pink shaded area in. Um, where we can see that um, um, quite obviously, really, the likelihood of injury or fatality rises um, as the fire gets worse and um, the, the person at risk or the victim um, probably be, um, becomes um, closer to the, the vicinity of this growing hazard that is fire and smoke. But particularly smoke, we, 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 we talk a great deal about, about the risk of fire and fire growth and perhaps not enough about, about the travel of smoke. But you can see that in that 16 to 20 minute period, there's a dramatic um, um, reduction in the outlook for somebody stuck in, in that scenario. And the, the likelihood of them becoming a fatality at the incident gets dramatically worse some, uh, during that 16 to 20 minute period. And that's pretty much always been the way, but, but most interestingly, the last time this was done most recently in 2012 was the worst result. And I think that probably is, is down to the plastics that we now have in our home and the toxicity of fires um, compared with um, the organic materials that we've historically had in our furnishings. Next slide, please, David. So there's, there's um, a lot of attention on response times. The public were consulted a few years ago and, and asked what they wanted to know about. And this was high on, on the list, was the response time, because this is, a, it's, it's, all, it's, it's very similar to the actual time of intervention for most people that live in a house by the street. So for most people, the response time means the time at which help arrives. Next slide, please. Now that, that's that graph from the previous page. You can see that, that, uh, that um, gray line, the light gray line at the bottom is the dwelling fires response time. And, and for the last few years, it's been between seven minutes and 30 seconds. If you look back 15, 20 years ago, it was more like five minutes and, and 30 seconds. But now it, it has stabilized um, at that time. And, and that, that seems to be, um, it seems to be leveling off now. So if, if, if you can expect a fire engine at a dwelling fire to take between seven and a half and eight minutes to arrive at the address. Next slide, please, David. 
So by arrive at the address, um, what we mean in, in, in terms of a, a house fire, we've got a timeline here from a time of call. And I've marked off there seven minutes and 30 seconds. That's the average response time. So the intervention time using that hose reel that you can see on the left there, all fire engines have got those hose reels. You grab the nozzle, you push a button, you run and you squirt the water. It's very quick to get to work and very effective on most house fires. And there's enough water in the vehicle to make the first strike on the fire an effective one or to get in and, and make a rescue. However, um, the, the situation is very different for high rise incidents. There's a guy called Steve Seaver and there was um, um, a, a, a double uh, a fatal incident at Flats in Hertfordshire when he was the chief fire officer there. And he did some work and they calculated that um, to, to, to set up for a, a safe firefight near the top of a high rise residential building would take approximately 20 minutes after the arrival time. So a realistic intervention time, if you live at the top of a block of flats, is probably between 23, 27 and a half and 30 minutes. Now, that's a radical, radical um, different um, perspective from having arrived at an incident at seven and a half minutes and, um, and arriving at a high rise flat in that period. It takes so many more people. It's such a, a complicated operation. And this is often where things can go wrong. If you talk to firefighters, experienced firefighters, they'll tell you that things go wrong at high rise incidents all the time. There's lots of things that can happen that will call delay, cause delays. There might be a problem getting in. There might be a problem finding the right floor. There might be a problem finding the right flat. There might be a problem getting the water supply. There might be a problem with the dry riser. And um, I was talking to a chap that collates um, extraordinary and fatal incident information for the Institution of Fire Engineers not long ago. And he noted that a lot of the incidents in the UK that he came across that um, where dry risers were used was that the nozzles got blocked because of rust and debris coming out of the riser. And of course, we don't flow test a dry riser in this country. We only give it a pressure test. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't give rise, it wouldn't deal with that issue or find it. That wouldn't be found until the firefighters turned up. And yet at, at, at a period, as I, as I showed you previously there, um, everybody is telling us that every second counts. That's why we put so much emphasis on response time is because every second counts. But the time to prepare for a firefight or a high rise incident is often a lot longer than the response time. We don't pay as much attention to that. Next slide, please, David. So sticking with the, the, the theme of time now and alluding to something I mentioned earlier about the spread of smoke, which we haven't paid enough attention to in the past. It wasn't quite so dangerous in the past. We didn't have so many plastics and we didn't have so many materials in our homes that produced um, um, toxic gases when they burn um, most notably carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide. Um, the, the, all of the, the victims that died in Grenfell Tower died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, hydrogen cyanide is, is a common one coming off plastics. Um, that's a chemical weapon um, that, that, that will kill. Both of those gases are odorless, colorless and tasteless. So they are an invisible killer. Um, with this in mind, the Dutch Fire Officers Institute got together with the Dutch Fire Academy and some very clever researchers and did some um, testing where they rigged up um, 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 a, an empty residential apartment building with gas detection throughout the building to see how far the smoke and the gases propagated from a typ typical fire in one of those apartments. Next slide, please. And lo and behold, there's that 20 minute period. It comes up again and again. Um, it, it's a tremendous detailed piece of research with the focus um, within the escape being on survivability and breathability. Um, your survivability depends on two aspects. It depends on the ability to see through the smoke and the ability to breathe through the smoke. Um, it's, it's irritants and poisons in the smoke or the toxic gases that will impede somebody's ability to escape. 
And as soon as a fire starts in one apartment, then anybody that has a, a shared corridor with that apartment, with a front door opening onto the same space as that apartment, um, is immediately at risk because um, straight away um, smoke and gases will start to permeate from the apartment where the fire is into that shared um, escape route. Um, and, and the longer you wait, the worse the, um, the conditions will be in that route that other people need to escape through. Um, so uh, providing the door remains closed, that atmosphere can remain breathable and survivable for a good period of time. As soon as you open the door to go into the fire compartment, you've effectively trapped the other people that share the same corridor. Next slide, please. So I've, I've, I've inserted that, um, that 20 minute line there into the, the, the graph we showed previously. So there's the 10 minute period. That's when you can expect an intervention if you're um, in a normal domestic dwelling by the street. The 27.5 minute period is where you can expect um, an intervention if you're at the top of a high rise building. Um, and the 20 minute line is, is the point at which the axes cross, but it is also the point at which um, um, the propagation of gases and smoke outside of the compartment of fire origin will start to influence the ability of other people at risk in the vicinity to um, survive the escape route. Next slide, please. So how, how, how should we be worried about, about this? Um, we've, we've got the propagation of smoke is a problem. Um, is fire spread a, a problem as well? These are, these are last year's figures. Um, and, and in order to demonstrate um, a catastrophic failure of the compartmentation, I've restricted this to fires that affect more than two floors or the whole building. I think we can agree that if a fire spreads that far, and please note there in number two near the bottom, this is the spread of fire. This is not the spread of smoke. This is about the spread of fire, more than two floors or the whole building. And between 2019 and 2020, it happened 36 times. That's on average every 10 days. And that's been consistent now for the last 10 years. And do you know what? Nobody talks about it. We don't know why. We've got um, a good indication that a lot of those are, um, are misrecorded bin fires, where it's in fact the whole building, but that's still, for, even if we discount half of them, that's still quite a shocking frequency with which in blocks of flats, um, fire is, is spreading a lot more than um, we tend to, to, to understand really. We need to get to the bottom of these anomalies that we can see with our own eyes that have been there now for some time. Next slide, please. So what can we do about this? And I, I, I talk to people quite a lot about, about what they can do on a personal level to improve their own personal fire safety. And one of the first things I'll say to them, well, the grade of smoke detector that you've got in your house is a grade D. You know, they're, they're, they're not the best. Um, the, the, the systems that have been developing for um, office and industrial premises for workplaces are far more evolved, far, um, far more accurate um, and, and, and far better at the job, to be frank. Uh, um, and this company, there's, there's, there's other companies, ACO, I, I was down at ACO last week talking about what they're developing. I've spoken to Apollo. They're all developing products now, um, which are more focused on the domestic market. Um, but using some of the technologies that have evolved elsewhere. Now, the, this is a kit for a flat or a house, and it's under £200. And that, that, that picture on the left of that pad is, is really quite ingenious because it joins all of the detection in, and, and, and it, it makes it accessible through that. At convenient height, beside a light switch on your wall, you can test and you can silence a false alarm in your own domain. So it's kind of like having a commercial fire alarm in your own flat with all the advantages of well-developed detection, and multimodal and hybrid detection, where you can put a heat detector and a smoke detector in the same head to virtually eliminate false alarms. But when you do get them, 
then it's convenient enough to, to, to silence the system until you've cleared the smoke. Next, next slide, please. Um, on the evolution of, of, of domestic detection and the advantages of these evolved um, technological commercial systems, well, um, some, some research published not very long ago, actually, by, by the BRE, um, it shows us that in, in actual fact, uh, from a commercial perspective, um, um, a, a good um, commercial style detector head like those we've just been looking at can be expected to last twice as long as your domestic smoke detector. I think they recommend replacing it after 12 years maximum and you can go over 20 years with, with, um, with a really good commercial detector head. So the, the, the commerce is actually making a lot of sense now to go with those more evolved systems. Um, um, we've known for some time now that um, domestic systems, that they, um, the noise, the sound that they make, they don't wake young children, they don't wake old people. And the commercial systems allow us to reprogram the noise that those, um, that the, uh, the sounder makes so that it can be, it can be a high pitch, it can be a low pitch, it can even have a voice programmed into it. And we know full well, there's plenty of research that tells us that um, the voice of a mother fed into a system such as that will be far more effective at waking up um, children than your average domestic smoke detector. They're, 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 they're imperfect and the commercial models are much superior. Um, next slide, please, David. But the real beauty of the of the of those um, self-contained domestic systems, perhaps, is that the 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 pad um, where where everything happens, where where you can test it from, and where you can silence your alarm, can connect to a broad, comprehensive, building-wide system, and act as a satellite from that. Why would we want to connect to an alarm system? Well, again, it's, it's nothing new, really. Neil Challenge did this research back in 2009, which showed us the advantages of using an automated alarm system against somebody being on the phone. It's all down to timing. Again, we've known this for years, that timing is absolutely critical. Um, the vertical axis on the left is the percentage of fires that became technically classed as large fires by the New Zealand Fire Service. And you can see there that there's a good steady 15% um, less when there's an alarm um, activating um, the mobilization of the emergency services. Uh, next slide, please. Um, high rise facade fires, there's, there's, there's a really useful list now on, on, on Wikipedia and um, there, there are 63 fires on there and two thirds of them, nobody died. That's because everybody got out of the building. I had that drilled into me when I was doing fire safety training. Good fire safety gets everybody safely out of the building. I sometimes wonder if we've lost sight of that a little bit. Next slide, please. Um, and to demonstrate that point, there was a fire not very long ago um, last year in Madrid in a high rise residential building. Um, I, I went on the Internet and I searched for it and I was offered the chance to rent a flat. And there was a nice series of pictures from inside the building on the left. You can see the emergency lighting, the brake glass buttons, the smoke detection. Um, and of course, the smoke detection, the alarm, the manual call points, you don't get any of that. We, we, we've still got buildings over 20 storeys tall with hundreds of people living in them that have got no fire extinguishers, they've got no smoke detection, they've got no um, alarms in the common areas whatsoever. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another tip that, that I'll, I'll give people, um, and, and this David and I have had a conversation about this. When you talk, they, they, they say that, they, they tell people to get out quickly and not to tackle the fire. Well, in 75% of cases, people do tackle the fire. Um, small handheld extinguishers are excellent. And David will tell you that somebody will much rather sustain a small injury than lose the contents of their home and their family life. 
Um, smoke hoods, I tell people to get themselves a smoke hood. I don't know why it took the UK fire services so long to cotton on to the usefulness of this brilliant piece of equipment, but they've been around for a long time and they're a worthwhile investment if you're in a high rise. And I would also buy an air horn because that will help you alert your neighbors in the case of an incident. Um, next slide. And that's all, I, I, I've tried to be as quickly as I can. Um, I hope you've been able to, to, to understand that quite clearly. And then um, thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Phil, for that excellent presentation. Um, again, so many things that I'd, I'd like to pick up on, but I think one of the things that really comes out from that as well is the value of looking beyond the headline. I know that if you ask many in the fire service and wider fire safety sector, it's been a success. We've seen fewer fires and downward trend for a long period of time. But much like yourself, when we digged into the data, we found that actually, whilst you was less likely to have a fire when a fire occurred, you was actually as likely, if not more so, to get an injury as a result of it. We're missing something by being happy just to take this top level. And I think that certainly it comes through in your work, it's much more complex, it's much more nuanced, and, and as to Jill's point, it's ambiguous. But we've got to really start teasing this out if we're going to effectively get anywhere with fire safety. And I, I commend you on the use of timelines. I find them such a great tool and a bit like yourself, that focus on the attendance time. Mm -hmm. We've got lots of data about that. It's, it's a keep up. We found almost nothing about what happens when people arrive, which is actually the most in useful bit. So I don't know which part of the country I'm safest in because I couldn't get any performance data of what happens when that first truck has put its handbrake on before somebody's rescued, before the fire's out. That bit of data is crucial, but we struggle to find it. But thank you ever so much for that. Christian, um, can I just check, before I introduce you, you wanted to run your own slides, would you? Yes, would that be okay? It's just, I feel we're about, you know, 50 to 20 minutes behind Jeju. And I think if I could go through the slides myself, I might be a bit quicker, um, mm -hmm. if that's okay. That's fine. Um, I'll just introduce you and then I'll, I'll come out of the slides and uh, give you, I think you can share from your end anyway, can't you? So I'll stop sharing. Yes. You can take it. Okay. With that, I'd like to introduce our final guest today, Dr. Christian Morgner. Christian is a senior lecturer in cultural and creative industries at the University of Sheffield. His research interests include intercultural competence, social justice, diversity and inclusivity. He has previously held positions and visiting fellowships at the University of Cambridge, Yale University, Hito Tsubashi University in Tokyo, and Ecole de Haute Etudes on Science Social. I've probably done absolutely no justice to that, I do apologise. Um, he's also worked with various public sector organisations to address issues of diversity inclus inclusivity, including the development of training packages for the Lakeside Gallery in Nottingham and the Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service. International collaborations include a project on cultural inclusion with the UN Innovation Network and European Commission on Disaster and Risk Management. Christian's presentation is titled A Person-Centred Approach to Fire Safety, and I first met Christian through his work with Leicestershire Fire Service, so again he brings a very, very valuable academic and practical insight to it. With that, Christian, I will uh, stop sharing and uh, hand over to you. Okay, David, thanks so much for this. Um, thanks so much for the invite. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, Nibidita, thanks so much for organizing this event as part of the um, ADN network. Um, so in my presentation, <clears throat> I would like to talk about a research project um, on which I've worked for the past four years, as uh, David mentioned with the Leicestershire uh, Rescue and Fire Service, but which was also supported by the Fire Research and Training Trust. And I was sort of, you know, report about um, some of the outcomes, um, some of the sort of, you know, more practical outcomes part of this research project. I think when we think about fire safety, it's really easy. You know, the, the first images that probably come to mind was, you know, when we used about fire safety to think about the burning building, right? And about, you know, all the measurements and, you know, all the kind of, you know, technologies that are required in order to deal uh, with a fire, right? So, you know, we heard a lot about, fire alarms and uh, smoke alarms and you know all sorts of you know different technologies that are involved in this however um and i think this is sort of you know the 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 nature of, of my presentation it only looks at fire safety in a very localized in a very sort of you know narrow sense because if you know when we look actually at fires from a sort of you know, broader social perspective 
we can see that they are unevenly distributed across the uh, UK. We can see, so if you know, that there are certain social groups that experience fires more than others. We can also see that certain social groups experience more severe fires than others. So let me just you know, give you a bit of an example, sort of you know, what we mean by this broader social context and kind of you know, shift a bit away our attention from sort of, you know, thinking about fire safety in this very localized sense. So I think in order for the fire service to be effective, you know, in order sort of, you know, to go sort of, you know, to a fire, it actually requires a member of the public um, to call the fire service. Yeah, so there's a burning building, right? And then someone needs to pick up the phone and alert the fire service. And while this might seem sort of, you know, completely natural to all of us, it is actually quite a complex task. So for instance, in the research that we conducted, we could see that 20% of the people that we as were part of our survey had experienced a fire in the last three years. So a relatively recent period, but only 2% of those people actually called the fire service. Yeah, so therefore we noticed there is a huge disparity in between experiencing a fire and sort of, you know, reaching out to the fire service in order to ask for help. So therefore, sort of, you know, as part of the research, we asked, what is it actually that prevents people from engaging with the fire service? So what is sort of, you know, causing sort of, you know, that uh, these obstacles and what can we do um, in order to overcome these? How can we build sort of, you know, better relationships between certain social groups? And the fire service. So that was sort of you know, a question we wanted to address. In order to address that question, we actually sort of you know, amassed quite a bit of data. Um, so that was quite a challenging project in itself, I have to say, um, because you know the fire service, or in general, sort of you know, um, there is a lack of sort of you know proper data being collected in a very sound way. In particular, sort of you know when it comes to collecting also certain demographics about people being affected. So unless there is a casualty and so forth. So very little data is actually being um, um, collected here. But then also, so there isn't a tendency as if, you know, within fire services to go out into the community and ask the community for their opinion, to ask, if, you know, about their knowledge, to if, you know, include their voices into the process. So therefore, sort of, you know, it was also important to conduct a survey um, of our own, as mentioned in here, which focused on um, less of black population. And then finally, sort of, you know, in order to develop some um, tangible outputs, we also conducted a number of focus groups with members of the public and a number of firefighters. So very briefly, this is in a way the research data that we collected over a period um, of uh, two years. And I think sort of, you know, there are two important outcomes that we need to consider. So when you think about relationship building, right? You know, we're talking basically about how do people engage with other people, you know? So this is sort of, you know, at the very nature um, of any kind of relationship building. So therefore, you know, first we wanted to understand in this survey, what is actually the model of engagement that we find in the community? What does that particularly look like? Um, and so, so you know, let me just, you know, walk you through some of the findings. So what you see here was a question where we asked, how important is it for you, um, so you know, within this ethnic community to know your neighbors? And when you look at the first two columns in this uh, chart, you can actually see it was highlighted as being something that is very, very important. Well, yeah, so knowing your neighbors, mm -hmm. knowing well, the well, community, well. Having, having that sort of, you know, knowledge is something that is considered as being very important. Also, we asked this question, so if you know, how comfortable are you actually talking to your neighbors, so if you know, interacting with them, conversing with them, really sort of, you know, have this kind of engagement uh, within the community. And again, as you can see, sort of, you know, people expressed a very, sort of, you know, high level of confidence um, in doing that. So therefore, sort of, you know, from this kind of research, we concluded, so if you know, among other factors, that there is actually a strong sense of social engagement within these communities, but sort of, you know, and this is sort of, you know, the caveat to it, they tend to be focused on members um, of the same ethnic community. So very sort of, you know, vivid, sort of, you know, social life that's going on within these communities, but very much sort of, you know, focused um, inwards. So therefore sort of, you know, we wondered why is that social engagement directed to members of the of the same community? So what, what are potential factors in a way that can explain that why people feel so much more comfortable in sort of you know dealing with members of the same community? And again, as part of the research, what really stood out to us was the role of trust. Yes, yeah, so again, when you look at this pie chart and you look at this sort of you know, two bigger halves, the one that's called 26%. 
and the one that's called 52%, you know, so the ones of, you know, more towards the uh, uh, upper right side and the lower side, again, sort of, you know, they show that trust plays a really important, uh, uh, important role. So, you know, trusting other people, having their trust, having this sort of, you know, mutuality um, in terms of knowing them, it really sort of, you know, is a, is a very important variable why sort of, you know, uh, people sort of, you know, orient themselves uh, towards other members of the same community. So therefore we, we conclude that, that the kind of engagement model that we find here is that personal trust and knowing other people really matters. So this is sort of, you know, a key ingredients in terms of how people within uh, such a community operate. So therefore, so, you know, then we wanted to ask in comparison to this, what is then the engagement model that we find within the fire service? How does it relate to this engagement model that we find within the community? And we looked sort of, you know, at a variety of feature. The first one I want to share with you looks more sort of, you know, at the typical kind of, you know, corporate communication in terms of flyers and brochures. And I bring, a, bring here a bit of a comparison uh, with sort of like another emergency service in order just to show you a bit of a contrast, how different sort of, you know, that corporate communication model looks like within the fire service. So these are sort of, you know, some of the visual flyers that you typically find uh, within the NHS, right? You know, you go to your local GP and this is, you know, the stuff you find either sort of, you know, on the billboards or the kind of flyers sort of, you know, you can pick up with sort of, I really sort of, you know, pick those um, at random because there is such a great variety in here. So when you look at them, right, sort of, you know, this is the kind of, you know, typical examples and you compare those to the very typical examples I show in the next slide. And again, so if you know, these are some very typical examples. So there's one from Leicester, uh, there's one from Chestershire, and there's one from uh, Swindon, I believe, in there. I don't know so if, you, if you noticed a difference between the two. And I think, you know, the difference I would like to point you towards is that the people are missing, right? So if you know, the actual firefighters who do the work, sort of, you know, who are sort of, you know, um, work sort of, you know, within this, this institution, they're not present in any part of the corporate communication, or if they are present, right, as we can see in the middle one, they're actually hidden behind a mask. We then also ask in our service, you know, the members of the public, well, if you had engagement with the fire service, what did this engagement look like? So, I mean, obviously, you know, there were quite a number of people who said they had no engagement at all. I mean, I understand it's probably impossible to have sort of, you know, an, an, an engagement with um, every member of the public. But then when we look sort of, you know, at the next column in the pie chart, so the ones of the, the second one, which is sort of, you know, the largest one in terms of the people experience engagement with the fire service. It was sort of, you know, through leaflets or sort of, you know, through minor cards that referred people to the website. The second sort of, you know, and again, larger area refers to talks and lectures. Why sort of, you know, the fire service talks at the community. So if, you know, provides sort of, you know, knowledge um, to the community in a very sort of, you know, typical lecture setting. And only sort of, you know, a very small number, actually 4%, of the entire service only had a kind of personal mutual engagement with the fire service. Yeah, so the kind of model in a way, the social engagement model that drives very much life in the community, only 4% sort of, you know, of the people in the service experience that model when they engage with the fire service. So therefore, you know, if we try so, you know, to compare a bit and bring out what do these uh, two different types of engagement model look like, you know, we see within the fire service is something that's very information driven. When you look at the flyers and the brochures, there is a strong focus on, you know, distributing uh, fire safety information, sort of, you know, telling the, uh, the general public what to do and what not to do. Yes, yeah, so, you know, and passing on that information. Whereas, so, you know, when we look at the community, there is a great emphasis on getting to know each other, um, sharing sort of, you know, a certain common knowledge, you know, having that sense of, you know, you're, you're, you're familiar, you can sort of, you know, link to other people. And in general, like I said, sort of, you know, trusting people, you know, it is really, really important. So therefore we wondered, so if, you know, what actually, you know, what is the impact of, you know, two of these, so if, you know, seemingly, so if, you know, strikingly different engagement models? What is the impact of that on on fire safety. How does it explain sort of, you know, to what I said at the beginning that 20% of the people experience a fire but only 2% um, call the fire service? Well, so what we see is that actually the fire service... So when we, so when we look sort of, you know, at the um, impact on trust, 
we can see actually that the fire service isn't uh, strongly featured in here. So like I said, you know, the NHS and sort of, you know, the ability to meet your GP on a regular basis, but also as part of the uh, corporate communication is sort of, you know, featuring quite strongly. So we can see, sort of, you know, there is a strong impact in terms of trust, in terms of, you know, trusting the fire service, considering the fire service as a trusted institution. What is the impact of that? So the impact of that is that 35% of the respondents in our service said, well, if, I, if they actually experience a fire, they wouldn't call the fire service, but rather ask a friend, a family member, or even a neighbor uh, to ask for help to put out the fire. We've also seen, like I said at the beginning, that 20% of the respondents had experienced a fire in the last three years, but only 2% contacted the fire service. Didn't have so if you know, the, the others, if you know, the confidence or felt so if you know, the fire service is someone that simply is on their radar uh, to ask for help in this case. And here's so if you know, some quotes where we ask people, well, so what would you do so if you, know, if you see someone else's house um, uh, is being on fire? And again, sort of you know, calling the fire service was not an, an immediate priority in these cases. So rather people said, uh, really, so if you know, first, if you know, try on my own, get everybody out safely. And only when it is really, really bad, right, then so if you know, I would call potentially the, uh, the fire service. So again, so if you know, there is an emphasis on, you know, um, I sort of, you know, as a member of the public sort of, you know, deal with this and help putting out the fire service and the kind of, you know, fire service is more like a side feature to this entire formula. So therefore we concluded, well, what is actually necessary is that is we need to build an engagement model is what we call that requires a so-called person-centered approach. Yeah, sort of like a, a, a model in a way that recognizes the person. And I don't know so for how much you know about this. So a person-centered approach is something that's typically sort of, you know, being developed within a healthcare context, you know, um, so if you know, but in, so if you know, general uh, well-being in hospitals, so if you know, there it is now quite common to be used. And the idea is that the very person, yeah, so if you know their sort of, you know, um, capabilities, their personhood and so forth is, is sort of you know, part of the center of the overall decision making. And that kind of model was something that we now also imported um, um, as a kind of model and how to build a different approach in terms of fire safety. So what does it mean? So what does such a person-centered approach look like within the context of um, fire safety? And here the idea is it is about the ways of working with individuals which take place, which place them at the center of deciding about their own fire safety and support them now and in the future. Yeah, so the person sort of, you know, is not being told what to do, but you know, their personhood, their values, sort of, you know, who they are, what they are about, their social context and so forth is taken into consideration when sort of, you know, building, um, a fire safety model with them. So what, what, what does it look like? I mean, obviously, so, you know, it's quite just, you know, a bold statement. How can we sort of you know, transform this into um, a tangible and you know, practical approach? And I think the way we sort of you know, tried to translate this was is that we kind of asked the question, so, well, so what is meaningful to each of us? Which means in a way, so, you know, what defines me as a person? So if, you know, what is the kind of broader social context that so, you know, makes me who I am in the sense of you know, if I would take away this sort of, you know, from that person's personality, then they wouldn't be the same person um, anymore. So these are kind of like you know, the core elements that need to be taken into account because they define so, if, you know, the, the person's values, their behavior, you know, their model of engagement and so forth. Right. And so, if you know, what I'd like to talk about are three, so if you know, different elements in the sense of, you know, that um, explain what is really, really meaningful to us. And obviously, sort of, you know, values, the first one um, is one of those. So, for instance, we then ask in the survey, well, so what are kind of, you know, the values in a way that define, you know, life in the community that are really sort of, you know, uh, uh, developing sort of, you know, this approach. And that was, so if you know, something that we've discovered here in the survey, so if you know, outlining what do these values look like. Right. And here sort of, you know, we can see actually this is kind of like the broader context in terms of, you know, what, what people share, what people value. And the question then is, to what extent, sort of, you know, can a model around fire safety take these values into account without, sort of, you know, violating or overriding, uh, or overriding them? We also then asked, sort of, you know, well, what should a good relationship look like? And so, if, you know, what was quite strongly voiced, sort of, you know, again, in a the focus groups that we conducted was, well, so you know, the first things we all said and agreed on was trust, that we wish that there should be trust. So again, sort of, you know, what this emphasizes is that here in a, in a person-centered approach, it's not so much about 
uh, you know, immediately sort of, you know, offering advice on fire safety. But so, if, you know, taking really a step back from the whole idea, but first, you know, you have to build a, tr a, a, trust, a, a trusted relationship, you know, with members of the community, with members of the public, because sort of, you know, once, you know, you have um, facilitated and built this kind of trusted relationship, then sort of, you know, you're getting to the point where you can actually, you know, talk about fire safety and potentially sort of, you know, hand out advice and expertise, because otherwise sort of, you know, why should people listen? Why should sort of, you know, people take this um, into account? So, you know, it's just like another stranger sort of, you know, who is offering some sort of expertise and advice. But if this comes from a trusted person, someone sort of, you know, where you can put a face on, someone, you know, you think you can rely on, obviously sort of, you know, this message has a much greater uh, impact and people are much more likely um, to listen to you. And obviously sort of, you know, what, what it also means is, you know, it means, you know, understanding the person in their social context. So it's not just, you know, when we, when we use the word person-centered, we want to offer a kind of, you know, more individualized approach. I think this is not what it means. It means to consider a person in the context, you know, in their social networks, their embedding within the social community. So therefore sort of, you know, it's also important to consider when, you know, we kind of uh, want to understand the fire safety of a particular person. And we also have to talk um, to their friends, Right, you know, we have to talk to their neighbors, to certain community gate gate gatekeepers, also other professionals, maybe sort of you know carers within the community, maybe the community police officers, and so forth. So really, sort of you know, only through sort of you know that we can actually you know develop a better understanding of the personhood um, that needs to be taken into account when developing a model uh, uh, for safety, uh, fire safety for this person. So therefore. Kind of you know trying to summarize what I've been saying really sort of you know what we would want to do is and let me sort of you know go through this um, table with you sort of you know slowly so that you don't have to read it all. So on the left side you know what you see in here is you see the kind of you know traditional approach to fire safety. On on the right side you see it's kind of like the model uh, towards sort of you know which we would like um, to develop uh, fire safety. What a, such a person-centered approach could look like. So let's sort of, you know, go through this sort of, you know, in detail. So on the first one, we see a kind of typical approaches that people are told, so sort of, you know, what are the kind of, you know, fire safety measures that they should apply. And they are typically based on, you know, some of the institutional guidelines about, you know, which we heard now quite a bit about in the other presentations. But, you know, what we would like to do is actually sort of, you know, shifting the approach much more to understanding what members of the public consider actually as being safe. Or unsafe. And we heard sort of, you know, uh, already being mentioned that some people sort of, you know, actually consider sort of, you know, putting out the fire, you know, you know, on their, on their own as being safe. And really sort of, you know, based on that understanding, we have to choose then, you know, what are the best way to actually say safe. Also sort of, you know, what's really important is that members of the public sort of, you know, currently do not have a continuous approach uh, to engagement with fire and rescue staff. Because what we see at the moment is usually, so if, you know, when you see a firefighter is when your house is on fire and not so if, you know, in other circumstances. And obviously this is not an ideal situation, your house is on fire when you, you know, to build the relationship with them. So therefore sort of, you know, what we need to see, so if, you know, what, what is the problem of this is that we've seen is that the fire, serve, fire and rescue service staff does not know well the needs of the community. They're not so if, you know, familiar with their uh, values and preferences uh, that we find and therefore sort of you know as cause of that you know the research shows that members of the public do not trust the fire service or even have anxieties yeah for instance you know some members of the public said you know they fear that if they call the fire service like you know they had like a, a cooking related fire and therefore think they caused the fire themselves that they don't have to pay for these services or they might even face um, criminal charges because sort of you know that trust relationship in such a sort of you know uncertain risky situation doesn't exist. So therefore, you know, it's really important that there is a much more continuous approach to this engagement because, you know, only if you continuously sort of, you know, show your face, if you repeatedly sort of, you know, be there, right, you can develop a good relationship. Only then sort of, you know, people can put a face sort of, you know, to that actual person and then sort of, you know, they develop this understanding, you know, of being more secure, that they can reach out to the fire service in, in such a sort of, you know, situation of great danger and risk. And then finally, also, you know, what we're saying is that fire service typically, so, you know, decide about fire safety strategies, often without consulting members of the public, or this is kind of like a mere, so, you know, box ticking um, exercise. So here, really, what we need is that fire service seek actively input from members of the 
public in sort of you know the decision making and um, training. So that could even sort of you know mean training up sort of you know certain members of the fire uh, of the of the general public to conduct sort of you know safety visits, home fire safety visits, um, and so forth. Okay, so that's for me. Um, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you very much, Christian, for that fascinating presentation. Again, lots of things to uh, to pull out of that. Really, one of, the, but I think you you um, captured as well something that we found with our work about. There's two narratives at play here. One from the, if you like, established sector with the professional response model, which is call the fire service for every fire and the other ten. When the actually the reality is showing us that in many cases, in fact, the majority of fires are dealt with quickly and safely by people at home without ever calling the service either through the lack of need to or because actually, as you say, the, the, the social factors and personal factors that inhibit that response. And I think if we then look at how that communicates, I know from my experience that we had a lot of marketing teams. I don't recall risk specialists, people that could really understand how we, as you say, tap into that social network in a less structured and formalized way, but actually make sure that the messages and support gets through in a, in a less clumsy way in, in some ways. And I think picking up from that is it's not surprising perhaps then that trust is an issue because actually we're, we're telling two very different stories, the believed and the as is, and we need to find a way to connect those and, and make sure that everyone play, brings to the, to the solution the bit that they can offer. It's not one or the other, it's everyone having a say. But thank you very much for that. I'm mindful of the time and I don't want us to um, extend beyond because I know we've all got other things that uh, we need to commit to today. What I would propose is that we um, miss the panel discussion. And I say that reluctantly, but I do want to keep us roughly on track. The other bit that strikes me is we've heard so many fascinating things on every presentation today. We could probably talk about this for the rest of the day and still only scratch the surface. And I hope that maybe what we can come back to is we'll have a think about how we can develop these conversations because there's so much, both individually in the studies and the experiences, but how do we connect those? I think often we get the chance to present our pre present uh, research or our perspective. What we need to try and find a way is to connect those and to pick out the bits that are common, the bits where we have disagreement. And actually disagreements are that if we constructively tease those apart, we might find new insights. But I do have a couple of quick questions which I've just that have come through the chat. Um, I think one's a general one and one's specifically for, you, for yourself, Jill, um, if I may just ask that. Um, let me just find that. So the question for Jill came from Lee Harvey. So he's partway through your book. And one thing that sprang out was the phrase ivory tower expertise. Could you give your take on that? Well, I think it's, um, you know, ivory tower expertise for me is traditional notions of expertise. So if you think about what Christian's talking about is there's the expertise of the residents, of the public, of the community. And in our traditional ways of valuing knowledge it's people with I should say masses of, of names behind their title but people that follow the Grenfell Tower and Curry that might not mean anything but people that have masses of university degrees or, or kind of more traditional ways of knowledge um, and, and that gets given more validity um, than the knowledge of the public uh, so that that's really what I mean by that term, and we need to rebalance our how we validate certain ways of knowing. Okay, thank you, Jill. And this question from, and I hope I pronounced it right, and from um, looking at the overall concepts of systems thinking, could it be said that a proper and detailed risk assessment could prevent fire disasters in high-rise buildings? Um, Christian, Phil, or Jill, would you like to tackle that one? Um, well, very simply, it's, uh, it depends how well it's done, but Phil will have more to say. But well, Yeah, yeah. A, a, a good risk assessment, um, something that we do need to change is that we tend at the moment to assess the risk of fire in residential buildings. We're not assessing the risk to people in residential buildings, and we need to start looking at individual risk based on the floor where the person lives. But certainly a good risk assessment is about mitigating those risks and uh, reducing the harms and outcomes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Phil. I, I think it, your, your point's well made. It, it, it's still seen as pre an engineering 
thing rather than actually perhaps the social side of the needs and desire uh, expectations and, and ability of the people that live there as I say picking up on Christian's point about the number that are dealt with and I think one of the things that comes to me is with its response times increasing and, and everything, we should be looking for the earliest opportunity to intervene and by relying on the professional response we are missing some of the things that sometimes are actually happening but actually other opportunities to tackle the fire at the yeah. earliest stage which gets the best outcome for people um, and a person-centered approach christian yeah. is absolutely right it, it's it's and i think there is that distrust and, and it's something i was going to explore in the panel session but we'll leave for another day about why there is so much distrust of the public mm. because the public are actually by reference yeah. everyone's doing every other job that we're not <laughs> it doesn't and yet in official circles there seems to be quite a a negative view of them and i think this bill mm. would probably uh, take the view there's so much untapped expertise both in terms of the knowledge of what the problems are but actually the innovation to come up with new solutions that are effective and relevant but uh, as i say we we'd better stop there um joyce did you want to run the second poll before i hand over to hideyuki to close the ceremony yeah that's fine i'll just run it now okay thank you So if everyone could just take the time to just quickly answer that question, it's to I suppose it's to see how the um, how today's session has um, impacted your knowledge. So I just need a couple more and then we'll get over the eighty percent. If you haven't voted yet, could we ask you just to uh, vote now and then we'll close the poll? We're going to accept that as 78 then, Joyce. Um, I assume so if no one else is answering anymore. We're at two minutes now, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll close the poll. Okay, thank you. But, well, thank you very much for that. And in bringing the session to an end, I'd like to pay thank to our speakers who've been provided fantastic insights into residential fires. <laughs> Christian Morgner, Jill Kernick and Phil Murphy, thank you so much for giving up your time and sharing your expertise with us. And hopefully, as I say, what we can start to do is bring these voices together to amplify them mm -hmm. and make sure they're heard um, and acted upon. Thank you also very much to Avoidable Death Network and all the team behind putting on today's event. It's been an absolute pleasure to uh, work with you on this and I'm very grateful for you providing the platform for us to share um, the debate around this subject. And thank you all very much to the attendees and for the questions and comments that you've made. That's greatly appreciated. Hopefully you will be able to take some of this away and uh, at least have a different perspective to bring to some of the issues when fires are discussed. And I think that's really what we hope that uh, this starts a debate. There's no simple answers, going back to Jill's point, but we just need to have that awareness that it could be very different and we need to come at this from different perspectives. I'm going to end again with Jill. I have hope. I know we've had many discussions over the years about uh, the obstacles we come against. 
I have hope, we have knowledge, we're starting to see different perspectives on this from Phil, from Christian, from yourselves and from the many other people that are active in this. There is a desire for sea change and actually the public can be trusted. They have a, a very good intu intuition and ability about this. And I think we, we need to make sure that uh, they have an equal say at every point of that journey. And we bring the best of the public and the professional services. And that way we will advance fire safety. So I remain hopeful. Um, I'm sure this conversation will continue, but thank you everyone for participating. Before we close, I'd like to now hand over to Hideyuki Shiroshita, who's a founding president of the Avoidable Deaths Network and also the Associate Professor of the Graduate School at, of Societal Safety Sciences at Kansai University. Thank you, David. So, hello, my name is Hideyuki Shiroshita. I am one of the president of ADN. So, thank you very much for all of you attending uh, the special session today. Uh, before we close today's session, on behalf of the entire ADM team, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of the people here to make this event happen. In particular, our big thank you to speakers, Joseph, who gave us very interesting and informative presentations, and to David for his perfect filling the session. So from uh, today's session, I learned how do we learn the previous experiences. Uh, when we talk about natural uh, hazard trigger disaster, such as earthquake and then flooding, we usually pay attention to the difference of the society when we do comparative study. But as for fire, we tend to think it is simply comparative. For example, as for Grenfell uh, Tower fire, most Japanese media did not cover the social aspect of fire. They uh, described uh, the they described the block of flats as a tower mansion. So in Japan, many people eager to live such uh, such type of you know tower residential mansion. But I think it is important to look at the social aspect of the residence. So yeah, from today's uh, session, I reconfirm this point. So thank you very much for your uh, very uh, informative presentations. Uh, so uh, again, thank you very much for your attendance today and uh, please kindly uh, join ADN. So you all are welcome to be part of our network. So just access our website. Thank you very much.